Hi, my name is uh, Wayne Beaton. I'm with the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, my role there is a Director of Open Source Projects. Uh, basically, that means a couple of things. First off, my, uh, my job is uh, to help the great many uh, projects and committers at Eclipse. We actually have uh, about 260-odd different open source projects uh, running at the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, and uh, a little over a thousand uh, committers, people who actually have uh, right access to our, our source code repositories. Uh, and my job is to help make them successful. Uh, one of the uh, unfortunate implications of that is uh, helping everybody else be successful uh, means that I don't get to play with technology quite as much as, I, uh, as, I, as I'm comfortable with. My training is actually in software development and that's what I prefer to do. Uh, so I've been uh, using uh, Eclipse uh, Rich Client uh, Platform uh, for, uh, Eclipse, from Eclipse 4 uh, for a little while, but uh, to be honest, I haven't done anything real with it. So uh, if you push me too hard with questions, Michael, um, <laughs> I may not have a good answer. Uh, but anyway, I'm hoping that I can give you uh, a good overview of what's, uh, what's in the Eclipse uh, for Rich Client Platform. And uh, from there, you can take that for further study and, uh, and ultimately success with the Eclipse Platform. Uh, before I begin, uh, who is an Eclipse user today? Just a show of hands. Is anybody not an Eclipse user? Um, does anybody, who, who here has a, an Eclipse Bugzilla account? It's always uh, heartwarming uh, for me to, to look out on a crowd uh, and realize that there are so many people out there who have just never had a problem with Eclipse. <laughs> Thank you so much for laughing. Uh, anyway, um, so my agenda today, uh, talk about what Eclipse RCP is. Uh, now, inevitably, when I deliver a talk along these lines, somebody is here to learn about what's new for uh, IDE users. So I'll talk a little bit about that, give you a couple of, of hints about what's that. But primarily, this is about the rich client platform, people building applications based on top of Eclipse technology. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll spend a, a, a considerable amount of time talking about the dependency injection mechanism and uh, the model GUI and a few other uh, aspects of uh, user interface construction. Uh, I'll wrap up with a little discussion uh, about JavaFX. I'm, I'm, I don't have too much to say about that. Unfortunately, the experts uh, in that field, uh, well, actually, fortunately, the experts in that field are actually at the conference. If you do run into Tom Schindel, uh, his, uh, he, he carries a considerable expertise uh, in that particular area. So um, start off with just a little bit of an overview. Um, Eclipse is probably best known for being an IDE. Uh, it's a pretty darn good Java IDE. Uh, it has a few warts here and there. But uh, by and large, it uh, revolutionized the IDE market and uh, continues to be the front runner uh, in terms of adoption uh, in the IDE space. Now, it may actually come as a surprise to some people in the audience that Eclipse was never actually intended, or certainly wasn't exclusively intended, to be an IDE. Eclipse was intended to solve an integration problem. The uh, problem that uh, software development faced in the late 90s was that we had lots of different tools that used lots of different technologies, uh, and the, uh, the uh, um, intersection points between the tools were a little bit rough. Uh, so uh, the Eclipse was originally created to provide a platform onto which different tools could be integrated. Um, and part of that was to build an IDE framework. In fact, uh, most of us have probably heard uh, of Eclipse being a, a modular environment built using plugins. Uh, it generally, or oftentimes comes as a surprise to people to learn that Eclipse is almost entirely plugins. Uh, there's a very small, tiny, tiny core of stuff in Eclipse that's not a plugin. But everything, the workbench, the package, manage, uh, the package explorer, um, all of the menu items that you see, all of the menu items that you see are actually contributed through plugins. And you can turn Eclipse into a very uninteresting IDE by removing the Java development tools, plugins. Uh, with that, you wind up with an IDE that manages files and has some cool menus and stackable views and all that cool stuff. But if you take that, that core base Eclipse IDE, you can put the CDT on top of it for C and C++, uh, C and plus plus, uh, C and C++ development uh, support. Uh, the PHP development tools through the PDT uh, project provide some plugins for that. So the idea is uh, we have this platform 
for providing functionality to developers of different forms. So if you were to look at my uh, Eclipse environment, you'll see that I have the Java tools, I have PHP support, I have some JavaScript support, uh, I have uh, some server management stuff, and I do all of that work from within uh, Eclipse. Uh, one of my favorite little uh, tools that almost nobody knows about is the uh, Remote Systems Explorer, RSE, which you can get out of our Juno repository. With that, you can connect directly to SFTP servers, FTP servers, and whatnot, and just directly edit files on an FTP server from within Eclipse. Uh, and certainly, you know, the obvious stuff, moving files back and forth is really easy, too. More general than that, more than general than just being an IDE framework, we've, uh, we see Eclipse being used as a generic tools framework. Uh, so you have the BERT project, for example, builds reporting tools. Uh, and these tools are used by not software developers, but business analysts to build reports and run reports and, and do all that kind of wonderful stuff. Uh, we have modeling tools, uh, web development tools, lots of other tools that sit on top of this, uh, this wonderful framework and integrate uh, very well. The plugin architecture lets you do some fairly tight uh, integration on the glass with some very loose coupling on the back, uh, which, is, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, functionality appears just by virtue of plugins existing uh, in, the, uh, in the mix. More general than that, and this, this actually started to happen around the Eclipse 2.1 time frame. This is a long time ago. Some organizations started to recognize that more than just tools and IDEs, the Eclipse framework, which provides stackable views and managed windows and managed menus and a component model that uh, allowed you to bring a whole bunch of neat stuff together and, and have it all integrate very, very well, was just a generally useful thing to have. We had organizations like NASA, for example, um, had, a, you know, had an, a problem with their... Um, um, had, had a, a similar integration problem, and they actually have uh, they actually use uh, Eclipse RCP as a base for the, pro the programs that their uh, mission controllers use to control the spaceships and, and experiments running on on rockets and all that kind of neat stuff. Uh, there's actually some RCP uh, based stuff uh, running in some of the new uh, rovers and uh, sorry, not the rovers. They, they've got these uh, moon buggies uh, that they're, they're working on the JPL. We're showing this, uh, showed this off at, the, um, at one of our EclipseCon conferences. Uh, so it's very cool. We've got Eclipse as an application framework controlling space vehicles, uh, which the Star Trek nerd in me is uh, terribly excited about this. Um, so basically, if you take all the things that make an e Eclipse an IDE, and that's things like refactoring support and the team support, integration with Git or CVS or Subversion or all those sorts of things. You take all of those out, you're left with just a generally useful framework for building applications that sits at a higher level than a lot of the widget toolkits that are out there. Uh, you know, a lot of people build applications for the desktop based on Swing or, or JavaFX or, or other component models. This is a little higher level of abstraction above those sorts of things. Uh, something actually that, that came about a few years ago is um, a group of, of people uh, decided that this framework was generally interesting, and they adapted the uh, Eclipse application framework, the, what we call the Rich Client Platform, uh, into a web-based uh, AJAX uh, platform. So, uh, so the idea is you build your application using standard Eclipse uh, tools to, to build your plugins with views and all of that, uh, and then it renders in a browser. So it runs, Eclipse runs on the server, rendering in the browser. Uh, and that, uh, that's come about uh, through the, uh, the Eclipse Wrap project, uh, which currently stands for Rich Ajax Platform. They're changing their name. But anyway, that, that's some cool stuff. So you can, you can use the Rich Ajax Platform to build using the, the wonderful Eclipse tools and deploy uh, to a browser. So as promised, a little bit of a discussion of what's uh, in Eclipse for the... Uh, for users. Uh, if you're just using Eclipse to build Java applications, uh, we have a new look for you uh, with uh, some fancy gradients. And uh, the quick access menu is pretty cool. Uh, in Eclipse uh, 3.7, 3.6, I think supported it. If you type Control 3 and just start typing something, it will find commands or views or preferences that match what you're typing and take you directly to them. The quick uh, access does something similar. If you just put your cursor in there and type, um, uh, J, uh, JRE. It'll, uh, it'll, it'll take you directly to the JRE preferences page in, uh, in, um, in the preferences dialog. 
that's pretty cool stuff. Uh, but anyway, that's been around for a little while. The other thing that you can do is that you can click now at the corners of, of where the different uh, view stacks join, and you can, you can move in both directions. I know, I know, I know. Um, so this is not meant to belittle uh, the, the accomplishments of the Eclipse platform team, which have actually been, they've been fantastic. Uh, the pro what it really more just to let you know that there's not a lot of new stuff in Eclipse 4 for people who are just using the IDE to, to, build, uh, to build Java applications. That wasn't the focus. The focus was to make it easier to build Eclipse-based products. Now, having said that, there's a lot of other things going on at Eclipse. And uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm showing on this slide has been coming for a very long time. We have um, the Hudson project has moved to Eclipse, so we have some, some build technologies brewing there. Uh, and now the value that Hudson is getting from being at Eclipse is we have some I IP management, uh, some community involvement. There's lots of wonderful uh, stuff going on there. But the Mylan project also has some direct integration from the Eclipse, from an Eclipse-based IDE to Hudson or Jenkins. So you can do direct management of your build technologies directly from the Eclipse IDE. Uh, and then there's some wonderful integration between that and issue trackers. So you can connect to Bugzilla or Track or Jira. Lots of different issue trackers can be directly accessed from within the Eclipse IDE. And again, there's some integration between that and the build technology integration. With Maven, uh, with the M2E project, we have uh, ability to support for uh, building and ma managing POM files and, and running uh, Maven, doing Maven-based uh, build sorts of things. The Mylan project also has a uh, reviews. Mylan reviews project provides integration with Garrett. So again, I can do direct integration with my Garrett server uh, and uh, with, from directly within the IDE. Uh, and of course, Git is something that's been coming, uh, coming on very strong at Eclipse. We started looking at Git in 2006, I think, was the first time we started looking at it, where we dismissed it and said, this is ridiculous. Uh, but uh, over the years, we've really come to embrace it, and now we're, uh, uh, we're actually we're at a point now where at the Eclipse Foundation, we have deprecated the use of CVS for open source projects, and all of our open source projects are migrating to Git. We're uh, upwards of about a little over 60% of our projects are now running Git exclusively. Um, and of course, uh, integration with Git-based repositories is an important part of that, uh, and the eGit project and the JGit project are providing that. Uh, I encourage everybody to uh, get directly involved with these projects if, if these are things that you're, you're curious about. Uh, and frankly, if you're trying to get involved in a project and they're not being helpful, tell me, Wayne at Eclipse.org. I, I try really hard to encourage, I work, I work a lot to encourage our projects to operate openly so that they are accepting of contributions from the com community. So application lifecycle management has become a huge thing at Eclipse. And in fact, we, a lot of our projects use a lot of this technology uh, as part of their, of their, um, their build processes and their, their sort of day-to-day -day, uh, processes. Uh, we have projects, for example, that use Garrett and integrate Garrett with Hudson. So when somebody contributes something through Garrett, it kicks off a Hudson build. And then Hudson tells Garrett, hey, this thing built OK. And uh, there's some wonderful, uh, very wonderful uh, um, uh, stuff that happens with, with this application uh, lifecycle uh, management technology. This one's a little bit subtle. It's something that many of you, if you've been using Eclipse 4.2 for a little while now, you've been using it and may not have even recognized that you realized that you were using it. Uh, one of the uh, bigger challenges that uh, we as developers face is finding what, we, what it is that we need to do. The Mylan project, actually, has anyone used Mylan? You need to look up Mylan. Mylan will change your life. Um, Mylan and code recommenders are about making your life as a developer easier. Uh, if you look at, uh, I got, uh, I've got a, an editor, screenshot of an editor open here. I've created a table viewer, which is a user interface widget. I think it's probably obvious what it is. Um, the first thing, I, next thing I do is viewer dot. Now, what's happening is if I look at all of the methods that viewer supports, there's a lot of them. And I'm really not always sure. I don't make enough of these to remember what, you know, what the steps are that I need to do. But Code Recommenders is saying, you know, everybody that makes a table viewer Sort of the thing they're most likely to do after they create a table viewer is provide a content provider. 
so that that table can show content. Uh, less often, they're providing a label provider. Right? So basically, they've taken usage statistics, the kinds of things that developers are actually doing, and they figure out what you're most likely going to want to do, and they put those options at the top. That'll save you some time. Uh, I know that it really helped me go through some of these examples. Like I said, I don't get to write code all that often anymore, so I kind of forget this sort of this stuff. And the recommenders did a great job of, of helping me uh, figure out what I needed to do. Uh, another thing, and I can't talk about this for too long, because uh, I can get caught, taken away by this, is uh, Orion. Um, Orion is uh, our, uh, a new, basically a, a new run at uh, some new technology that runs in a browser. So Ryan, Orion is primarily JavaScript, although there is some server, uh, some Eclipse server uh, uh, aspects to it as well. But uh, the idea is that you connect to orionhub.org. You can go to orionhub.org today, get an account, and start using this. Um, it's basically JavaScript editing in the browser. It also supports CSS. Uh, there's some work going on to support PHP. Um, there's a lot of talk about Java support, but we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, so the idea is that your browser becomes the IDE, and one browser page is an editor. You can go to another browser page, and that's a navigator. One of the things that they've done is they've learned a lesson. Uh, we tried a few years ago as part of the Eclipse 4 effort to bring Eclipse into the browser, and we found that we spent entirely too much time fighting the browser. Browsers like doing things one way. IDEs sort of like doing things another way. So what they've done is start it over with Orion, and this is acknowledging that the browser is in charge and, uh, and working with that. So you can actually have multiple, uh, multiple editors open, and they're just other pages, just other tabs in your browser. You can move, a, you know, just whatever the browser supports. If you can turn, uh, you know, your browser lets you have open multiple windows. So you can have multiple windows open. Uh, it actually allows you to run your JavaScript. Uh, it, you know, it does um, um, sort of mini servers that allow you to, to run run your JavaScript directly uh, from the source code itself on the server. Anyway, some very cool stuff. I invite you to take a look at Orion if you care about uh, JavaScript uh, editing. Uh, and like I said, orionhub.org is a place you can go to try it out. The one thing that I will advise you is Orion Hub lets you do things like pull from other Git repositories and, and work on Orion Hub. It doesn't do so securely. Uh, right now, it doesn't support SSL. The other caveat is... Um, Every once in a while, we have to blow away the contents of the server, so don't leave anything there that you like. Uh, apparently, the porn uh, industry has gotten us to a point where if somebody was to put something unsavory on the server, we'd have to deal with that, and right now, how we deal with that is blow everything away. Anyway, so back to the topic. What is a rich client? Rich client runs on the desktop, can run in a browser, too. Um, and again, with RAP, we support that sort of thing. Platform independent, managed windows, menus, and toolbars. It's got to be something more than just a widget toolkit. We, of course, have to have widgets. You need to have tables and trees and labels and push buttons and all that kind of neat stuff. A component model. Uh, when I looked up uh, Rich Client, the first time I started talking about Rich Clients, I, I looked it up and it said, see Fat Client. Uh, I contend that they are different. Fat Clients tend to be these monolithic things that uh, we built in the early 90s. Uh, rich clients tend to be more dynamic, uh, you know, again, factored into components. Updatable, extensible, uh, having a decent component model makes both of those things uh, really easy. I have a picture down here. This is sort of the mental model that I, tended to, I tend to form when I think of a rich client, is a rich client is talking to some back-end service, which is then talking to a database. Uh, some parts of the application are there on the, the application server. Some parts are actually in the client. Uh, although that's not necessarily the case. Rich clients can just be completely standalone things. There's no, uh, no restriction for this. From a, uh, an Eclipse uh, ecosystem point of view, the Eclipse rich client platform sort of fits in here somewhere. Um, <laughs> we have Equinox at the bottom. Equinox is our component model. It's based on the OSGI spec. OSGI is the uh, component model that you can use in Java today. Why wait till Java 15 for a component model? Okay, no, that was supposed to be funny. All right. Thank you for laughing at me thinking it was supposed to be funny. Um, so Equinox, again, OSGI, if you're looking for a component model for something today, take a look at OSGI. Equinox is the uh, reference implementation. 
Uh, on top of Equinox sits the rich client platform. On top of that, there's the tools platform. On top of tools is the IDE platform. So you have all these sort of layers of, of plugins that provide increasing levels of functionality on top of which everything sits. So I got the Java development tools and the plugin development environment on top of the Java development tools. So if we, if we just look over here on the, uh, the right side, though, I have my rich client application sits on top of the rich client platform. Uh, and you know, it kind of does, it can actually, you can actually use other aspects. There's no rules that say you can't use aspects from the tool, uh, tools platform. But uh, simply, uh, simply uh, put, it's, the, it's just the stuff on top there. Um, Rich server applications are something that we started to see around the 3.0 time frame. Uh, a lot of organizations started to recognize that the OSGI Equinox thing that we had that was our component model underneath everything was just generally useful for building headless applications and servers. Uh, to the point now where we see uh, application servers, many of them are running on OSGI, including Glassfish and Jonas and WebSphere, sort of. Um, so OSGI is, uh, and, and Equinox in particular, are used by a lot of organizations just to build servers now. Um, you sometimes hear Eclipse 4 and E4 used interchangeably, just, uh, just for those of you that, are, uh, that, that care. Um, E4 is actually what we call an incubator project at Eclipse. It's a place where some ideas are, where are experimented on and, and grown, incubated. At some point, things leave the incubator. Many things left the E4 incubator to become part of Eclipse 4. Some of those things actually became part of three, uh, Eclipse 3.7 and 3.8 as well. Um, we've actually got some compatibility uh, layers that allow the Eclipse 3.x uh, uh, plugins uh, to function on the, uh, on the new technology. Um, so uh, in terms of the differences, if, uh, if you've been building stuff with Eclipse 3, uh, 3 and uh, with Eclipse 4 now, we've got an updated programming model. Uh, almost everything now is running on Java 5. Prior to that, we were uh, almost all of our plugins uh, in the 3.x uh, stream uh, ran on uh, Java 1.4, which was a little bit limiting, but what the, in terms of functionality that could be used, but it meant that the platform could be used in lots of different environments. Um, so on, on small devices and, and, and whatnot that didn't have the Java 5 support. But uh, anyway, so we've updated. We're all the way up to Java 5 now. Uh, some plugins are actually uh, being very radical and going as far as, as Java 6. Uh, it's exciting times. Um, we have the modeled workbench, which we'll talk about briefly. Uh, much of, uh, of, of the new stuff in, in 4 is all services-based, uh, heavy use of dependency injection. Uh, one of the uh, big design points for Eclipse 4 was to remove uh, the heavy dependence on the singleton pattern. There's a lot of singletons in the 3.x uh, stream. Um, which made it really hard to do things like make a server based on Eclipse that uh, served more than one uh, customer. Uh, so, so a lot of the work was done to remove all those singletons, and uh, they've done a fantastic job of that, uh, and we're pretty well situated right now to, say, set up an Eclipse 4 based server on the back end that did all your compiling, static analysis, all that neat stuff, serving Orion-based clients in browsers, which I, th I think would be a pretty cool thing to have. Um, if anyone's interested in working on that, please come and see me. Um, and a simplified API. <clears throat> the, the modeled uh, UI is uh, based on the Eclipse modeling framework, EMF. Uh, and uh, we have these uh, wonderful XMI files, which are uh, files that you can force someone to read if you really hate them. Um, so the, 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 uh, the center point is this application.e4xmi file, and it describes, I'll show you what, a little bit, a hint of what this looks like. Uh, I won't show you the XMI because that's just cruel. Um, but it, it just describes the structure of your application. And you have the ability to add fragments to that. So you can say, I've got this core bit of my application. It's got these window, these, these, these views or these parts, uh, and then add other views and parts and menus and other types of contributions into that core bit of application. So what we wind up with in this model is a hierarchy of parts. So I'm showing here on the, um, on the left, uh, this is actually a snapshot of, of an of a editor that we have for um, defining the, uh, the model. And you'll notice, uh, if I scroll, if, if you move down to uh, controls, there's a perspective stack. Uh, inside the perspective stack, I have a perspective. Inside the perspective, I have some controls, a, a part sash container, 
a, uh, and then the parts sash container contains a part stack that has a couple of parts, and there's another part in here. So now that model renders on the screen, uh, as I show here uh, on the right. Uh, and you'll see that uh, extra info and producer are stacked on top of each other and have tabs. These are two parts that are sitting in a part, or sorry, that are sitting in a part stack. By sitting in the part stack, they wind up with tabs so that you can switch between them. Uh, and they sit on top of each other. The consumer, however, is uh, sitting outside of the part stack, uh, and it, as you'll notice, doesn't have the tab or all of that uh, neat stuff. It doesn't conform to you know, what we traditionally think when in Eclipse, there are all these view stacks that all have tabs and stuff. Well, we can set components outside of those, those tabs if we choose. Um, and I've got some linkage between them. I click on something in producer, and then consumer displays it. That's uh, just sort of some implementation stuff. So if I change things around a little bit, inside my perspective, I, I just have a part stack now under the controls. I have a part stack, and that part stack has three different parts. Uh, and those three different parts are all stacked on top of each other with tabs, because that's what I've specified. There's no, uh, let me go back, there's no sash container. The sash container gives me two halves. In this case, I have a, a sash container that splits the screen uh, vertically. Uh, I can also make a sash container, uh, sorry, a, yeah, sash container split the screen um, horizontally. Uh, you'll notice too that the tabs here are a little bit different in shape. I've been, I was messing around with the CSS a little bit, and I'll, I'll show you that uh, in a few slides. So another uh, variation here, I have uh, a perspective stack that has two part sash containers. I've got one part sash container in, uh, contained within another. So the, uh, the top one underneath controls uh, has a horizontal split. And uh, the, uh, the one that nested underneath it has a vertical split. So we see that the producer and the consumer are beside each other. And that puts the extra info down at the bottom. Anyway, just a couple of ideas. So basically by manipulating the model, I can change how my application gets rendered. Uh, and then again, I can, put, I can use fragments to insert other components. So if I, if I needed another type of part and I wanted it to participate in this as well, I can have a separate plugin that contributes that and then you know, dynamically decide if I'm going to include that plugin or not uh, at runtime. So to edit the model, I have this uh, wonderful editor. Uh, the editor itself, if you want to uh, get access to it, uh, it's actually not been released. This is, uh, we're still kind of in the early days of Eclipse 4, uh, and the, some of the tools that we use for actually building this stuff are still in the incubator. Um, so in order to get access to the, the model editor, you need to load it or edit, uh, uh, pull it in from the uh, from the E4 repository. Uh, actually, in here, I'm showing the Git repository. Uh, it's actually available. Uh, there's a built version of it that you can just install directly into your Eclipse uh, workbench. Uh, I should have provided a link to that. Unfortunately, I don't remember it off the top of my head. Um, here, I'm showing I've got a part selected. And in this part, I've got a bunch of things that I can specify. The ID of the part, that'll be useful for referring to the part in code or for uh, extending it through, through fragments. Uh, label, what label will it have in the tab? Uh, tool tip, tip stuff, is there an icon? That, that kind of neat stuff. The class URI is uh, the implementation of this. How does this view get rendered on the screen? How do I d uh, create the contents of it? Um, and then there's some other things. Is it closable? Uh, will it be rendered? Is it visible? Um, some, uh, does it have a toolbar? Uh, and then there's some other, other things. That, honestly, I don't understand. No, I'm just, it's, I, you know, I'm still experimenting with some of those other things. To implement the part, I provide a class. And that class is referenced from that class URI field. I have an implementation class. In this case, I've not actually implemented anything. Uh, this has been generated by the tools for me. Um, I uh, make a class called something. In this case, I called it more info. The name it doesn't really matter, actually. Um, and I specify uh, some number of methods. In fact, I don't really even have to specify any methods. That, that doesn't really help me do anything. But uh, uh, there's no uh, 
there's no explicit contract in terms of implementing specific interfaces or naming conventions or anything along those lines. It's all done through annotations. So uh, I have uh, the more info constructor, and uh, I'm telling it that I'm going to do an inject onto that. So this is the dependency injection kicks in and says, hey, when I create an instance of this thing, I need to give it a composite. I need to give it a parent, something to actually draw itself on or, or render itself on. Um, and I'll show you how it gets that in a minute. Um, I have some other, um, other uh, annotations. Uh, post construct, so after I've constructed, run this. After I, or before I destroy this component, run that. Uh, when um, time comes to give this, this part focus in the, in, the, uh, in the window, this is what I want you to do. So uh, a lot of uh, plugins will put focus into a particular entry field or, or into a particular widget or something like that. Um, in 3.0, in the 3.x uh, stream, pardon me, uh, we had to jump through a lot of hoops. And this is a, actually a, a, a simplified uh, implementation of uh, adding a selection listener. Basically, the workbench has this concept of selection. So when a selection occurs somewhere, the selection service kicks in and says, oh, I'll take that and I'll tell anybody who cares that the selection has changed. Um, so in Eclipse 3, I go and get the workbench and uh, I have to make sure that I'm running in the a, a UI thread. Um, I tell the selection service, or sorry, I get the workbench, active workbench window. There was a time when I could do this from memory, but uh, I'm finding it harder and harder. Thankfully, Code Recommenders uh, actually helps with this. But anyway. Um, Eventually, I get down to a, a method that I will invoke whenever the selection, so basically the idea is whenever the selection changes in the workbench, do this. With Eclipse 4, it gets a little bit easier. Uh, instead of, of going and hunting down the uh, selection service, I just ask the framework to inject it. Give it to me, please. Uh, so my part uh, implementation, which again is just some class that has uh, some annotations in it, um, I tell it I want to inject the selection service. I give it a type e selection service, and it knows how to find the selection service and give it to me um, if it exists. If it doesn't exist, in this case, if it doesn't exist, my part wouldn't load. It wouldn't run at all. It would just stop because it doesn't have the information that it needs. I could specify that it's optional with an optional annotation there. If it's optional, then uh, it null is a valid value for that field, uh, and, um, and the injection service would, would, would move on. So basically, I tell the, I, I've got the selection service. Uh, in order to add a selection listener, I just tell the selection service to add this selection listener. That's a lot easier. But it actually gets a little bit easier than that, uh, although uh, easier may be uh, subjective in this case. Uh, actually, one of the things you'll notice is that my selection changed. The thing that I'm going to do when I change the selection, I left empty here. Uh, on this example, I actually provided an implementation. So the last three lines are actually the implementation of this. Um, so I forget all about the selection service altogether. I don't really care about the selection service. All I want to know is that a selection has occurred. So I create a method in my part class called whatever. It doesn't matter what it's called. I put the inject annotation on top of that, uh, that method. And for the parameter, I say that, it, first off, it's an optional parameter. If there is no selection, life goes on. I want to find a named thing, I'll tell you what that thing is in a second, I'm getting there, um, give me the active selection. And that active selection will probably be an I-structured selection. If it's not an I-structured selection, this won't get called. So if you selected something in another view in a table, that produces an I-structured, uh, an instance of, uh, of structured selection, which implements I-structured selection, uh, passes that to the, 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 the selection service, Eclipse then wakes up and says, hey, this part cares about the selection, and I'll just give it to them. Right? So this method will be invoked any time the selection changes in the workbench. So I've simplified considerably. Again, if you consider that the, last, the, the actual three lines of code that are in here, I didn't actually show on either of the two previous slides. This is really one line replacing like a dozen lines of code. I think that qualifies as easier. Uh, the dependency injection stuff is like magic. Uh, it's, it's very cool and a little creepy all at the same time. Um, 
But even better than that, uh, one of the things that uh, I like to do is I, I don't, not, not everything that I'm working with is necessarily a generic selection. Sometimes I'm working uh, with things that are very specific. There's a concept in, you know, I want to have a concept in the workbench of the product that I care about. Um, so what I, I do, I do uh, instead is um, instead of working with the selection service, I have at the top there, I have a producer. The producer basically says, give me the context that I'm running in. I'll we'll talk about context in a second. Give me the context that I'm, sit that I'm in, and when, um, when the user clicks on the, the, the entry in the table, I will tell the context to set the products that it cares about, that it knows about. Um, now, I'm actually talking about the parent again. I'll tell you that and what that means in a minute. On the consumer side of things, the consumer says, I care about the product, or the products, I guess. So I'm going to add another, a method on the consumer. So these are two different classes. The consumer says, when the products are changed, so I care about the thing named products, tell me about it. Right? So instead of having some service that manages the, the, pro, the, the current product, selected product, or the current product in, in, my, in my workbench, I can just shove a value into the context, and the context in the Eclipse framework takes care of making sure that anybody who cares about that thing is told about it. You can inject lots of different stuff into your, your implementation. Um, the context, uh, again, I'll talk about what that is in a minute, but it, it, it uh, describes the, uh, you know, the state of the application at, at different levels. Um, I can say, give me the active part. So if, if I'm clicking from uh, view to view to view, that changes the active part in my workbench. And I can be told about those changes and, and do things based on, on those changes. Uh, I can say, what is the shell? The shell is sort of the top level window on, into which everything is rendered. I can gain access to all the different aspects of my application directly through this dependency injection. I don't have to go hunt it down. I don't have to ask a singleton for it. I don't have to walk up some component hierarchy to find it. I just inject it and it gets, it's given to me. Now the way this all works is it's going through the Eclipse context. Uh, the idea is uh, we have this container, uh, containment hierarchy of things, part being the smallest thing, uh, application being the biggest thing. Um, parts, perspectives, and applications each have their own context. So there's certain values. This is basically key value pairs. Keys are strings, values are objects of some kind. And I can shove things in to the context at different levels, and everything that cares at that level or below will have an opportunity to receive the injection of that change. Right? So in my previous example, I had uh, set the products. I told the context of my part. Right? I've injected the context. First thing I'm doing is injecting the context. That would be the context of my part. I'm telling the context of my part, give me your parent. That's the context of the perspective. This is your product. By putting it into the perspective of the Sorry, and putting it in the context of the perspective, everything underneath that perspective is given an opportunity to receive that thing, receive notification that that has changed. Um, so since I have a consumer and a producer, they're both in the same perspective, I change the perspective's value in the context. My producer can then basically talk indirectly to my consumer. Cool, not cool, all right. Um, if I just put it, if in this slide here, if I, if I had just put uh, the products into the context, that would have been in the part context. The part context is specific to one part, so all the other parts would never be told about it. OK. okay. So uh, this context is an important aspect of, of, of making the modeled workbench work. And of course, it, um, it goes up multiple levels. We have a, 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 the window context. A window, there could be, uh, you can have more than one perspective. You can switch between perspectives, just like you can do in the Eclipse workbench today. Um, if I put something in the perspective co uh, context, then only things contained in that perspective will know about it. If I put something in the window context, all of the perspectives would be given an opportunity to see it. And then, of course, I can override in lower levels of the context. I can have a, win a value in the window context and then a different value in one of the perspective contexts. And everything contained below is 
is sent different injection information. I'm hoping this makes sense. I'm not seeing anyone screaming at me. So, okay, so I'm going to move on. Uh, that's kind of um, the, the model and the, the context. I want to talk a little bit about styling before, uh, before, we, go on, uh, get, before we have to leave. Um, one of the um, criticisms that we've gotten about Eclipse Rich Client Platform in the, back, uh, in the, in the past is that it looks uh, way too much like an IDE. Uh, I would contend that a lot of applications just look like IDEs anyway. But um, so this is, there's an attempt here to make it not look quite so much like an IDE. Uh, and in fact, the, I'm not sure this, actually, this example actually gets us there because it still looks awfully IDE-like. But uh, there's a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, for example, details of Kai Toter is, uh, you know, I could remove that tab pretty easily by instead of putting this into a part stack, just having the part sit by itself. That gives me some flexibility. Um, and there's lots of other things that you can do. Um, styling is one thing that allows me to make it look at least so it doesn't look like Eclipse. Um, I've got an example here of some CSS and how it renders. So uh, I talk about the, the things in my UI uh, using things that are very familiar to people who, who understand CSS. The, um, just a straight class name, composite, uh, I can reference uh, any, any composites that are, that are, that are built uh, on the page. Or I guess the top one, label. Any label on the page, I can say, this is the font you're going to use. This is the color that you're going to use. Color would be the font color. Um, for a label that appears inside a composite, though, this is a diff you're going to use uh, different colors. Um, separator label is, um, the hash mark is an ID. So if I, if I, have, a, yeah, if I have an ID, uh, on one of my parts that I, in my model, I can model, I can directly modify the CSS of, of just that, of things that can, that are just that ID. Uh, I can also do, uh, um, there's a dot one too. Sorry, I just lost context. Uh, anyway, uh, so it's, it's very familiar to uh, CSS uh, kinds of people. You'll notice certainly that things like background color and color and border and, and, uh, and other things like that uh, allow us to do um, some very similar things that you can do in CSS. Some of this stuff you can actually update live. Uh, not everything, unfortunately. This is something that they're still working on. Uh, and you are, of course, limited by what the underlying platform can allow. If the underlying platform doesn't support changing the color of a label, this, we can't do anything about that. We use platform, we use native platform widgets under most, most stuff. Uh, another slightly different example, I've changed uh, around a few, uh, a few of the colors and, and things to get a slightly different look. It's exactly the same code, just with a different uh, CSS, changes the, the appearance of the application. This example, um, did I provide a link? Yeah, there's an example, link to the example here in the uh, wiki.eclipse.org if you're curious. Um, it, uh, it can... Uh, it, it, it can change its theme uh, on the fly. Uh, this slide I find distracting because uh, Kai Toter's uh, avatar is the greatest avatar I think I've ever seen. Yeah? Just me? All right. Is this thing on? Hello? Okay. Um, so if I'm uh, doing just SWT sorts of things, uh, I have, oh, here we go, the uh, M part stack. So the, uh, the dot, um, if I'm, I can address uh, different uh, types in my model directly. So if I have a part stack, in this case I do have a part stack with three parts in it, I can do things like change the, the way that the borders are rendered, uh, uh, the, the radius, uh, key line information, uh, padding, that kind of neat stuff, uh, colors. So you have a great deal of control over your, your appearance without um, doing a lot of coding. Right? We could do a lot of this stuff in Eclipse before, but you had to jump through hoops to make it happen. And then it was a bit of a pain to change and maintain. There are some tools to help you with this. Again, these tools are a little on the rough side. They're um, part of the E4 incubator. They've not, not yet been released. Uh, I'm showing the CSS Spy. Uh, this is pretty cool. You basically just uh, include the CSS Spy plugin in your RCP application, hit the magic key combination, which uh, on Linux means uh, switch to a different terminal, um, control shift. F4, I change it to be just F4. Um, anyway, uh, what this does, it allows you to look at the hierarchy of parts 
And uh, you can actually modify things and see the change immediately in the UI. A lot of things work, not everything. Uh, so changing colors works, changing fonts does not. Uh, but it does allow you to uh, have a you know, fighting chance of figuring out what, uh, you know, manipulating your UI uh, in, a, in a custom way. Uh, the thing that I have selected in the CSS Spy um, is highlighted on the window, which is also handy for telling me what I'm looking at. The, um, the CSS Editor, also a little on the rough side, uh, it helps you with some code completion options to build your CSS. Um, I invite you to take a look if you're curious, and please provide feedback uh, to the developers uh, through your, your, your Bugzilla account, which everyone's going to need. <clears throat> um, so there's, uh, there's lots of things going on with Eclipse 4. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about renderers um, to, to sort of start my wrap up here. Uh, one of the things that some members of the community did is they, uh, well, sorry, back up a little bit. The Eclipse 4 team uh, put a lot of effort into separating how the application is modeled versus how it is rendered. Uh, so someone from the community stepped forward. Uh, it was actually Kai and uh, Tom Schindel was actually here at the conference. Um, stepped forward and they built uh, a JavaFX renderer. So you basically use Eclipse to define your application's model, and that the fragment thing all works, and um, the, the, the dependency injection, all of that stuff uh, just works. But instead of rendering it using our SWT, uh, uh, simple standard widget, no oh crap, standard widget to Steve's widget toolkit, um, that's funny to the insiders. But anyway, um, Instead of using SWT, we put JavaFX underneath it. So this is the JavaFX version of the same application we've been looking at. Um, and then there's also um, an SW, or sorry, a Swing renderer. And this is the, uh, the Swing version using the napkin um, uh, look and feel, which is pretty cool. Uh, so the, the model is reused. Uh, there's an opportunity to reuse a lot of code. Uh, ultimately, though, when you're building the contents of the part, you're using the platform-specific things. So on SWT, you're using table viewers and, and composites. On JavaFX, you're using uh, border panes and other kinds of things. But the implementation, I showed an implementation in SWT before. Uh, let me see. Showed an SW, this is the SWT version. The constructor takes a composite as its, uh, as its uh, uh, as the, the palette on where, or as the, the, the platform, that, the thing that it's going to build on top of. Um, there's nothing particularly clever here, though. The composite is something that the context knows about. And when I do this injection, the injection just pulls the composite out of the context and gives it to you. When we're doing something on, when we're doing the same thing on JavaFX, the context contains a border pane. And the dependency injection just says, hey, you want a border pane? This is the one I know about in my context. Here you go. And then your constructor can then go about building on top of that. And then say post-construct works, pre-destroy pre works, on focus. All of these things sort of work the same way, but with a JavaFX implementation. Similarly, a swing implementation would have not a border pane, probably what, a J-frame, J-panel, a J-panel or, or would be injected in this case. So it's not free, right? You can't just take the, you know, can't just build one of these using SWT as your renderer and move it over to JavaFX for free, but a lot of your application infrastructure can be moved over for free. Uh, so I just want to talk briefly about components. Uh, I've mentioned Equinox is the um, a component model that sits underneath uh, Eclipse. Uh, Equinox uh, actually is, is a pretty, uh, pretty robust uh, component model. It's, Eclipse is a pretty big thing. Uh, your average Eclipse installation sports hundreds, not thousands I don't think, but hundreds of different plugins. And Equinox manages all of those. It dynamically loads things when they're necessary. It maintains, de uh, manages dependencies. It actually manages different versions of dependencies. So if I, for whatever reason, needed two different versions of the same library, uh, Equinox is capable of loading and managing the relationships between the components and actually having two different versions of a library used by different aspects of your application. Um, so it, it supports 
versioning of your components. Um, it uh, uh, dynamically figures out the dependencies and loads loads the right versions of the right components when it needs to. Uh, it also supports the, the concepts of dynamic update and install. A lot of application servers leverage this functionality to dynamically unload functionality and load uh, alternate forms of that functionality, even things as simple as servlets, um, doing this without restarting your application server. Uh, RCP style architectures uh, tend to be, uh, basically you have your application, you make a couple of plugins, they sit on top of all of our plugins, what we call the Eclipse Rich Client Platform. Um, over time, organizations mature a little bit and uh, realize that they have more than one of these applications and they factor out some common subdomain of components, which is commonly shared by the different applications. This is something that NASA did with their, their Maestro uh, application. They took Eclipse Rich Client Platform on top of Eclipse Rich Client Platform, they put a whole bunch of components that, really, that are really good at talking to spaceships and running uh, experiments and doing those kinds of some sort of generic talking to spaceshipy kinds of things. Uh, and then each of the uh, project teams then builds uh, an Eclipse plugin or two that sits on top of this framework. And then they integrate it all together into a single package that the mission controllers use. When they, uh, when they control uh, um, uh, uh, some experiments uh, up, that are running up, uh, up in space. So the idea is, again, you start off by just building a couple of components. Over time, we start to find common things that are just generally useful and build our own platform on top of the rich client platform. Uh, we see things like even the Eclipse Rihanna project uh, does this sort of thing. The Eclipse Scout project does this. Um, and there are other uh, organizations doing similar things. You see this within large banks. They have their own little frameworks that they, uh, the platform that they, they build on top of the, the RCP. So some wrap up. Uh, if you are curious to learn more information, uh, go to the Eclipse wiki, uh, wiki.eclipse.org slash E4. Uh, this is proof that even the Eclipse 4 versus E4 naming thing is confusing to our own people. Um, there are numerous tutorials and resources online. Uh, Lars Vogel is a, a prolific uh, creator of tutorials. He's also an excellent instructor if you ever happen to be in Europe. Um, there's uh, some links there to, uh, it's Vogella actually, oh it is Vogella.de. Uh, he uh, he's some great stuff if you want to learn more. Um, a lot of the uh, content for this presentation came from uh, some, some, uh, some people that have been very heavily involved in our community. Uh, just acknowledge that uh, their help was invaluable. And with that, uh, I'm done the main portion of my talk. If there's any questions, I, I'll take them now. Yes. Oh, hold on, hold on. Mm-hmm. Well, well, NetBeans is yucky and awful. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, 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 yeah, they probably said the same thing about Eclipse. The difference is they were wrong. Um, <laughs> no, uh, so we actually have a couple of different JavaScript uh, things going on. We have a JavaScript uh, project within uh, the, that's part of our web tools stuff. A new project just came in. It's called VJet. Uh, that uh, it's basically the, the code that, e, that eBay uses to build JavaScript stuff, and that's something that we are. Uh, uh, we're onboarding at this, at this point, and uh, I'm hopeful that that will become a real project and start producing deliverables uh, shortly. Uh, our JavaScript uh, implementation right now is, I would say, pretty good. Um, I'm, I can't give you a ringing endorsement uh, of it. It's, you know, I think right now the Orion stuff is a little further ahead than our, uh, our, our standard JavaScript, you know, Eclipse IDE-based JavaScript. The Orion stuff is really fantastic. It supports uh, content assist. Um, uh, it's super fast. The editor is actually uh, feels faster than uh, running in a browser feels faster than an Eclipse IDE editor. So I, I would encourage you to look at Orion. Question? I am not aware of any right to left language support in the model GUI, but I haven't needed that. So I. Uh, I would be surprised if we didn't have it, but if I, I can, the best, way to, best place to ask that question is on the Eclipse um, uh, project forum. You go to uh, eclipse.org slash forums slash uh, eclipse.platform. That would be the best place to ask that sort of question. Yeah. 
I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can I, can I use Eclipse 4 and Eclipse 3 at the same time? Is that the question? Well, a, a great deal of effort has gone into a compatibility layer that allows you to run 3.x plugins in the 4.0, uh, in a 4.0 uh, RCP application. So, uh, yes, that's possible. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Wrap? Yeah. So does that work only for SWP? Or does that work for So 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 one of their there's their one of their they're actually they're morphing the project a little bit, so they're changing their scope. The the current version or the current form of the project is you use SWT to build your application and they actually render it in um, they, they render it as it's a JavaScript they use a JavaScript library whose name is escaping me, uh, to render it in the browser. But it, it all starts from SWT components, yes. So if you had a, an RCP application that, in, that, in, that embedded the three components, it would work? Yeah, I wouldn't know. The swing components, I don't believe that that could work, no. Other questions? Yes. Uh, okay, so the question is uh, using J JNLP to deploy JavaFX based uh, application. I don't know. So that would be a question, uh, again, for the, the forum. Um, Eclipse.org slash forum slash eclipse.platform would get you uh, some help on that. Other questions? Yes? What do we use for unit testing? Uh, that varies from project to project. Some projects just use JUnit. Uh, we have SWTBot, which is another uh, option that some projects use. Uh, some of our projects are now using Jubula, which is the GUI Dancer is a commercial uh, GUI testing uh, software package that was recent, well, two years ago now, I guess, they contributed it to open source at Eclipse. So there's lots of different options for GUI testing. I've never tried. There's no reason why it shouldn't, though. It, the, the nature of how it's implemented, it should just work. Question? Yeah, that's a little out of scope. Uh, the HTML5, uh, CSS3. Uh, actually, we're sort of, the CSS stuff is evolving. I think we're, we're approaching a, C, a CSS 2.0 compatibility. Uh, it's really not, we're not, we're, not, it's, we're, not, we're not attempting to compete with HTML. Five. That's just not the, just not the space that this occupies. All right. With that, if there's other questions, please feel free to hound me after. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.